Good morning, everyone. Joy to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we move to the word of the Lord today, Mimi's announcement reminded me of a time when I was doing youth ministry, and I was in charge of the middle school ministry at my church, the the junior high ministry, you know, uh, ages sort of 11, 12, 13, you all know that age, familiar with it. And I remember one morning uh, being in the Sunday school room and, and looking out over the crowd, and there were 75 junior high students and I was the only adult in the room at 25. And I thought, if they figure out what's going on here, I am in big trouble. <laughs> so, uh, but I live to tell the story today. Uh, and I would just put in my plug as well uh, for Sunday school, for youth and children's ministry. I, I think it's one of the, the great calls that we have as a church, as a church body, uh, to teach our young people, our children and our youth, about the love of God uh, in Jesus Christ. And so if you are feeling at all, like God might be calling you to that, uh, to explore that, to talk to Dan or Miranda, our youth leader, uh, because we would love to to help you get connected in that way, but you will be blessed by that. So let's go to the word of the Lord. We're looking at John chapter 20. Once again this week, we're going to be looking at verses 24 through 29 as we look at encounters with the risen Christ. And uh, last week and today, and then again next Sunday, we're going to be looking at these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ from the gospel of John, these last couple of chapters in the Gospel of John, and how uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples, the risen Christ appeared to his disciples, and we see that their lives were fully transformed after these encounters with the risen Christ, these these, uh, fearful and doubting disciples, and yet we know that they went out and changed the world. This week we're going to be looking specifically at Thomas, uh, the disciple Thomas, the apostle Thomas. One of the things I love about him, I've talked with several people this week about how Thomas went and preached the gospel in India and uh, the, the origins of the Christian church uh, there, uh, the tradition says that he went there and preached the gospel there, and such a beautiful thing. But he didn't start off that way, and we're going to be looking at that a little bit this morning. So let's uh, look at the word of the Lord from John chapter 20, starting at verse 24, and let's pray before we read. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again for the gift of your word Uh, which you have spoken to us through the prophets and the apostles, which is inspired by your Holy Spirit. So Lord, we know that this is your word, that you speak to us, that you continue to speak to us through it today. And we give you thanks for that. And we ask, Lord, that we would be ready to hear what you have for us, ready to receive it. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would make us fully yielded vessels uh, in your service. We pray this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where his nails were and put my hand in his side, then I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is another, another great passage that we're looking at this week. It's a well-known one, uh, likely to many of you, especially if you grew up in the church, you've probably heard this story before. You've heard about Thomas. And it takes place just one week after the passage that we looked at last Sunday, which was the first resurrection day, the first Easter Sunday. And if you remember that passage, or if you were here last week, then you remember that the disciples, they were all gathered together in one place, and the doors were locked, and they were hiding, they were in fear for their lives. Because just a few days before, Jesus, who was their friend and their leader and their Lord, had been crucified. And so they thought, rightfully, that because they were his followers, because they were so closely associated with him, that their lives might be in danger as well. And so they were hiding in this house, and the doors were locked so that nobody could get to him. 
And then all of a sudden, Jesus is there in the midst of them. The risen Christ just appears out of nowhere, and he wishes them peace. He says, peace be with you. And he shows them his wounds. And then he gives them his Holy Spirit. And then he sends them out into the world with his good news. And it's this big moment for the disciples. It's the first encounter for most of them with the risen Jesus Christ. But then in our passage today, the one we just looked at, there's a significant detail that we're told about that encounter that sets up uh, what we're going to talk about this morning, which is that Thomas was not there. One of the disciples was not with them on that first resurrection day and did not have the benefit of getting to see and experience the risen Christ. He missed it. He wasn't there. And because he missed it, we get this big moment with Thomas that we're going to be exploring a little bit more this morning. Another big moment for the disciples and for Thomas especially. So before we get into the passage and dig a little bit deeper into it, the question I have is, who is Thomas? Who is Thomas? This is something for us to look, up, uh, look at this morning. He was one of the 12 disciples, obviously. And when we talk about the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles, then we are talking about Thomas as well. He is included in that group. And he's also one of just a few of the disciples who become known by a nickname. We have Simon, who is called Peter, or the Rock. This is a name that Jesus gave to him. And then we also have James and John, these two brothers. Does anybody know what their nicknames were? Sons of Thunder, right? Jesus gave them that. I always wonder, why did Jesus give them that nickname? That's a, that is a great nickname. So the Sons of Thunder, right? And in the scriptures, we're told that Thomas is also known as Didymus, or the twin, that that was a name that he was known by, uh, by the people around him. We don't know exactly why. We assume maybe he had a twin, but we don't know for sure. But the name that really sticks with Thomas is one that's not given to him in the scriptures, right? It's the one that many of us know him by, uh, Doubting Thomas, right? Thomas the doubter. You all know. You all know. Uh, and so this isn't one that Jesus has given to him, but it's the one that has stuck with him for 2,000 years now. And it's, it's an unfortunate way to be remembered, right? Uh, let's be honest, especially when as followers of Christ, we place such a big emphasis on faith and belief. And yet here is Thomas the doubter. That's, I mean, it's not really fair to him. Let's be honest. Who wants to be known for doubting? Who wants to be known for doubting? Oh, here comes Mike. You know, he's a doubter. <laughs> we don't want that to be the case for having a difficult time believing. In fact, I think a lot of times in the church, probably in an unhealthy way, we always want to show how strong our faith is. We want to prove to others how much faith we have. We don't like to talk about our doubts. We don't like to admit those to others a lot of the times, except for maybe people just really close to us. But here we have Thomas the doubter. When I was growing up, the first time I learned about doubting Thomas was during my Sunday school classes. My Sunday school teachers would teach us about him usually around this time of year after Easter, probably talked about him several times over the years. And I imagine that I learned a lot about him as a child growing up. And I think due to that nickname, I always had this negative view of Thomas. In my primary school age sense of self-righteousness, I thought he really should have known better. Thomas, he should have known better. He doubted and, uh, when he should have been believing. What is wrong with this guy? What is wrong with him? And he even knew Jesus. And I don't remember that my Sunday school teachers emphasized it that way. Uh, I'm not sure that they taught us that we should think of him that way, but that's how I absorbed it. Thomas was out there as sort of a negative example. Don't be like this. If you want to grow up as a faithful Christian, don't be like Thomas. Because he doubted when he should have believed. But of course, this isn't the only way to see Thomas, doubting Thomas. There are other ways that we can think about him as well. And many pastors and commenters who have talked about Thomas have swapped out this negative description that we have for him as doubting Thomas for other ones. And so these are a couple that, that I found over the last week. Uh, John Stott, who was a 20th century uh, British evangelical pastor, uh, talked about Thomas this way. He said, perhaps he should be known as absent Thomas. 
absent Thomas because he missed the earlier gathering with the disciples. And, and, and in his very winsome way, if you've ever heard John Stott talk or preach, he said uh, he uses this to reflect on the importance of not having sporadic church attendance, right? <laughs> He says, listen, if you are going to skip church on Sunday, you are taking a calculated risk because you never know what blessings you're going to miss out on if you are not here on Sunday morning. What if the risen Christ shows up in the body at church one morning and you're out walking in the mountains? Well, sorry guys, you missed it, okay? So Stott says, come to church every week as much as you can. He also talks about uh, Thomas this way. He says uh, Thomas is sort of the patron saint of the modern era, right? The great defender of empirical evidence. I'll believe it when I touch it and see it for myself. Otherwise, it must not be true. It must not be true. I have to see it. I have to touch it. I have to feel it. I need evidence, hard evidence to believe this. The Anglican pastor and poet uh, Malcolm White says this. He said, Thomas should be called more honest Thomas or courageous Thomas or even tenacious Thomas. I like that. White calls Thomas the father of his faith. And he says that he is the one who is willing to say what everyone else is thinking, but are too afraid to speak up. What both of these pastors do and what all of us should do if we want to come to know Thomas better, if we want a fuller and more fair and three-dimensional picture of who Thomas is, is to look at the rest of Scripture to see what it has to say about him. In the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we don't really find out much. We just see his name included on lists with the rest of the twelve. But John has a bit more to share with us about Thomas. There are two other stories where Thomas has something to say that help us to get to know him a little bit better and maybe give us a a little more of a fair picture of his character. The first time we hear Thomas speak is in John chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And most of us remember sort of the end of that story when Jesus shows up and he, and he weeps and then he heals Lazarus. He calls him out from the tomb. But leading up to that, there's this uh, exchange where Jesus is far away and Mary and Martha have sent for him to come. They say, our brother is sick. And Jesus stays where he is for a couple more days before he goes. And then he says to the disciples, let's, let's go back to Judea. And the disciples challenge Jesus on this. They say, weren't we just there? Didn't they try to stone you when you were there? We don't need to go back there. This is not what you want to do. And so Jesus explains the situation to them and says, this is why we're going to go back. We're going to go and heal our friend or help our friend. And so the disciples are are ready to go at this point. But Thomas speaks up and he responds saying this to the rest of the disciples, let us go that we might die with him. Let us go that we might die with him. And here we see Thomas as a loyal friend and disciple to Jesus, willing to stick by Jesus' side, even if it puts the rest of them in danger. Let us go so that we might die with him. And then in John chapter 14, Jesus is is telling the disciples about the reason that he has to leave them, why he is going to lay down his life. And he's explaining to them the future hope that it is giving to them. And he's talking about how he is going to go back to where his father is. And in his father's house, there are many rooms. And he is going to prepare a place for his disciples. And that he must go away from them in order for them to do that. And then he says to them, you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas comes back with this great question, or comment, I should say. He says, how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. He said, we don't know where you're going, Lord. How can we possibly know the way? And this is why Malcolm Gwight likes Thomas so much. He says, everyone else there was thinking the same thing. Jesus, we have no idea what you're talking about. And yet they sat there and they nodded their heads. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. And yet Thomas spoke up and said, no, we, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And because of that, we get this great statement back from Jesus that we might have missed if Thomas hadn't made his comment where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes through the Father except through me. That's in response to one of Thomas's comments there. 
So whether, uh, let's see, he was brave enough to speak up when nobody else would. And whether that's true or not, whether that's true of Thomas or not, we do see here a disciple who wants to understand. He wants to really and fully understand what Jesus is talking about, what is going on with this person that he has given his life to. And he's willing to ask the hard questions regardless of how it makes him look. And he's not afraid to say what's on his mind or how he really feels, even when dealing with matters of faith and of Jesus himself. And I think in that way, Thomas is not so different from Old Testament figures like Moses or Jeremiah, who were willing to be honest with God, to maybe even push back against God, to challenge God in some ways. And we see this happen throughout the Psalms as well, people being honest with God about the struggles they're having, about the questions they're having, even sometimes about the doubts that they are having. And so these other passages, short though they are, allow us to see Thomas as more than just a doubter, but as a real human being who goes through ups and downs in their life and in their faith. And even if all we ever knew of him was today's passage, many of us would find Thomas to be a relatable, maybe even sympathetic figure because we know how he feels. In fact, all Thomas is asking for is the same thing that the other disciples were given just the week before. I want to see the risen Christ too. I want to see his wounds. I want to know this is true. It's not always so easy to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And maybe you've had your days when you have asked for a little proof yourself, a sign of some sort. God, I'm having a hard time believing today. Will you give me a sign? Will you show me your presence? Will you help me to know that you are real and that all of this that I put my faith in is true? And I've also wondered if Thomas's lack of belief was as much about a loss of hope as it was about a lack of evidence. That may be part of what keeps him from believing based on what the other disciples have told him is a sort of a self-defense mechanism on his part. Because everything that he has given his life to had seemingly come crashing to the ground just a week before. What if I believe this, what my friends are telling me, only to find out it's not true? Only to have my hopes crushed? It's too risky. I'm not going to let myself be hurt again in this way to put my faith that Jesus might have risen from the dead only only to be disappointed again. And perhaps there are those of us here who can sympathize with those feelings too. For whatever reason, Thomas refuses to believe simply based on the testimony of the other disciples and he, he gives his ultimatum. He lays down his gauntlet. He spells out the requirements that he needs in order to believe. And he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And there it is. There it is. You couldn't ask for a more intense statement or more vivid imagery of what Thomas is looking for as evidence to prove that Jesus has risen from the dead. He wants to know. He wants to really know before he is going to believe. And so the risen Christ graciously grants him his request. Here we are, just one week after the resurrection, we're back in the same house with the same people, all the disciples to gather together, but Thomas is included this time. We're hiding behind locked doors once again. And again, Jesus came and stood among them and says, peace be with you. Everything is exactly as it had happened the first time, just one week earlier. And then Jesus turns to Thomas and he says to him, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. And I think there are a few things for us to see in Jesus' response to Thomas here. And I think the, the first one is this, the risen Christ still has his wounds, The risen Christ still has his wounds. Even in this new, redeemed, resurrected body, this body that is not going to see corruption or decay ever again, the wounds are still there. The marks of our sin are still there. The price that was paid for our forgiveness is still clear for all to see. 
These are the wounds by which we have been healed. These wounds aren't meant to stand in judgment over us. They're not meant to be uh, something that makes us feel guilty for all of our sins and failures for all of eternity. What they should do is serve as eternal reminders of God's love for us and just how far he was willing to go in order to rescue us. So that's the first thing that we see in the risen Christ here. And the second thing that I hope we see is the Lord's gracious response to Thomas and giving in to his demands. It doesn't always work that way with God. Let's not get too excited here. We don't always get to just ask for things and have God grant them directly. We don't always get to make demands of God and have him respond to them. But for whatever reason it was, whatever Thomas was going through at that time, whatever the cause for his doubts or refusal to believe, Jesus understood it better than Thomas even did himself. And he was willing to meet Thomas where he was and to provide what he needed in order to restore his faith. Jesus lets Thomas see his risen body and to touch it and to experience it for himself. But then Jesus even goes a step further. He gives Thomas what he asks for, and then he calls him out of his doubt and into faith. He says, stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. And this is the line that gives Thomas his infamous name, But it's also in this line that Jesus reveals his desire for Thomas, his heart for his disciple. I've often heard people say that Jesus meets us where we are, but he doesn't want to leave us there. He meets us where we are, but he doesn't want to leave us there. And this is exactly what we see happen in Jesus' response to Thomas. He meets him right where he is, in the midst of his doubts, with his fears, with his hopelessness, It's a beautiful picture of God's grace that we are given uh, in our passage here. And then Jesus calls Thomas to a place of deeper faith and trust in him. Friends, there is a place for doubts and for questions in the life of faith. And sometimes they play an important role in helping us mature as followers of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have to wrestle with things before we can accept them. And there are hard questions out there. And it is not bad for us to ask them of God. And yet at the same time, if we're not careful, then we can let these things weigh us down, keeping us from moving forward in our faith. And we should be wary of using our doubts and questions as excuses for not following Christ fully in our lives. Using them as excuses to not be fully yielded vessels. There is no virtue in doubt for its own sake. I am a doubter. I don't believe, I I still have questions. That's okay. It's okay to have questions. But Jesus says, come to me in faith with your questions and doubts. It's unlikely, friends, that we are ever going to get all of our questions answered, at least not this side of death. And there will be new ones that pop up throughout our lives. What Thomas is offered and what the other disciples were offered and what even we are offered as the basis of our faith is not the answers to all of our questions, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself, crucified and risen, who says, stop doubting and believe. Here I am, risen from the dead. Put your faith in me. Maybe that's a word that someone out here needs to hear today. What is holding you back? What is holding you back? What doubts are you holding on to? What are the things that are keeping you from fully giving your life to Jesus Christ? And Jesus is saying to you today, stop doubting and believe. You can put your trust in me. I have risen from the dead for you. Stop doubting and believe. It may be better to think of it uh, less as Jesus calling us out of doubt or, or past our doubt as if we can simply walk away from them or leave them behind, it may be better to think of it as Jesus calling us to bring our doubts before him or to trust him even as we wrestle with our doubts. It's often as we follow him in faith that things are made clear to us, that questions are answered. But wherever he finds us, his desire for us is the same as that as it was for Thomas, that Jesus wants to call us to move from doubt to faith. And Thomas does. Thomas does. His response uh, to his encounter with the risen Christ 
is one of the simplest and yet most powerful statements of faith that we find in all of Scripture. He simply says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Thomas has stopped doubting and has believed. The American uh, pastor Eugene Peterson finds in the two parts of Thomas's proclamation, my Lord on one hand and my God on the other, the two fundamental ways that we as human beings are given to respond faithfully to God, obedience and worship. He has this to say, Thomas's prayer keeps us ready for what comes next. It keeps us alert to the Jesus who rules our life as Lord and who commands our worship as God when we are least expecting it. Following Jesus is not a skill that we acquire so that we can be useful to the kingdom. Following Jesus is not a privilege that we are let into so that the kingdom can be useful to us, but it is obedience, my Lord, and it is worship, my God. This is how we are called to respond to the risen Christ, my friends, in obedience and worship, in proclaiming him our Lord and our God. There's an element that we see in Thomas's prayer of relationships being returned to their proper order. Thomas had been making demands on Jesus, and now he is submitting to him as Lord and worshiping him as God the way that it should be. And there's a way in which Thomas's proclamation even makes a nice bookend for John's gospel, even though we still have a little bit more to go. John begins his gospel by claiming that Jesus was himself God, come to be with us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now here at the end of John's gospel, Thomas worships Jesus as the living God. Doubting Thomas has become one who truly sees and truly believes. The whole passage today ends with Jesus saying to Thomas and the rest of the disciples, "'Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed.'" And when Jesus says this, he brings all of us into this story as well, because the disciples got to see the risen Christ in the flesh, and their renewed and strengthened faith was based on the physical encounters with the risen Christ. But that has not been granted to us or to the vast majority of Jesus' followers over the years. We have believed, or we have been asked to believe, without seeing the risen Christ in person. And so Jesus says, blessed are you who have believed even though you haven't seen. And Jesus isn't commending any sort of blind faith here as, uh, as if we have to check our reason at the door when we come into the church. This isn't a call to believe with no foundation. In fact, the whole New Testament is written to give witness to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that goes along with it. There is reason to believe. But we must believe on the testimony of these witnesses, these reliable witnesses, and the witness of the Holy Spirit within us. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans, he says, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Jesus says, for all who came after that first generation of believers who actually saw the risen Christ, that we are blessed for having believed by what we have heard. So I want to close today by looking at these statements of Jesus in our passage and what they might have to say to us today. So we just looked at this one where he says, blessed are you who have believed without hearing. Jesus comes in by saying, peace be with you. And this connects our passage today with the one from last week. It's a reminder that we have been forgiven and that there is no need to fear. And I think one of the things that I have always found interesting about this passage, I say always, in the last few years, I found interesting about our passage today is that Thomas gets all of the attention, rightfully so. He also gets all of the flack for being a doubter. And yet, friends, what is going on with these disciples? Last week, they were in a house. They were afraid for their lives. They were behind locked doors. Jesus shows up. He says, peace be with you. He gives them the Holy Spirit, and then he sends them out into the world with the message of forgiveness. And here we are a week later, and where are they? Back in the house, behind the locked doors, afraid for their lives, (laughs) Jesus appears to them again and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. 
And I point this out only because I wonder if we don't often find ourselves like these disciples in our life of faith. We know we've been reconciled to God. We know that we have been forgiven of our sins. We know that we have received the Holy Spirit and have been given new life in Christ. And that we have been sent out into the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And yet we end up back in the same place. Unsure of what to do with it all, how to move forward. Maybe afraid for what the consequences might be if we actually went out and did what Jesus called us to do. And Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. It's the gracious word of the Lord for us. Peace be with you. But he doesn't want to just leave us there. That's okay. So Jesus says, peace be with you. That's a word for us today. And then Jesus also says, stop doubting and believe. Another word for us today, as we've said. Jesus meets us in our doubts and our questions and our fears. He invites us to bring them to him in faith and in obedience and in worship. And then he calls us to a new and deeper trust in him. I think this is part of faith, to obey and to trust and to worship, even when we carry doubts and questions with us. But we shouldn't miss that Jesus wants to call us out of our doubts. Not necessarily all of our questions, and maybe we should make a distinction there between doubts and questions. We will always have questions, but to approach Jesus with our questions in faith and not allow them to keep us from following him, to giving ourselves fully over to him. And finally, I I find the most compelling word from Jesus in this passage goes back to his body and his wounds. He offers them to Thomas. He says, see my hands, put my fingers here, put your hand in my side. These were the means of Thomas's salvation. They're the means of our salvation. And there are echoes here of the Last Supper and of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for us. Because Jesus offers the bread and the wine saying, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Jesus offers himself to Thomas in this passage to renew and to restore him. And in the same way, he reveals himself to us in the sacrament, in the breaking of the bread, to renew and to restore us in our faith as well. Friends, may we all respond to God's gracious offering of himself in Jesus Christ in the same way that Thomas did, in obedience and worship, saying, my Lord and my God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you today, first and foremost, for the grace that you have extended to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that that the risen Christ came and appeared to the disciples, walked among them for many days so that they could see and believe that they could uh, trust in the new life that is offered through our risen Lord. And we thank you that their testimony has been passed down to us through so many years and that you have allowed us to believe through hearing. We pray today, Lord, that whatever doubts and questions and fears we have with us, that you might meet us where we are, but that we might also hear your word to stop doubting and to believe and to go out into this world as you have sent us in the power of your Holy Spirit to be your faithful witnesses. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.